Okay, it's 1.30 p.m., the new time for Run Chat Live. Um, we're hoping this works out. Like I explained last week, it's normally at 9.30 in the morning, but there's a few reasons why we've changed it to 1.30 p.m. Um, first of all, it means that we, uh, people in other parts of the world, apart from the UK, um, can actually uh, watch it. So particularly USA friends, um, 8.30 a.m. in the morning for most of them. Hopefully you'll be able to join us in the future. Um, and also it means we can get a larger range of guests. I mean, there's some fantastic guests who have made all sorts of efforts to come on the show um, at 9.30 a.m. GMT. But again, it opens it up a little bit more if we do it at 1.30 p.m. GMT. So that will be the running time um, from now on, uh, 1.30 p.m. GMT, which is 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. And particularly for today's show, and most importantly, is what I think is going to be half past two GMT plus one for the wonderful, fantastic people of Tunisia. Um, why am I talking about Tunisia? Because today we are going to be honoured to chat to the founder and director of what is rapidly becoming the ultimate 100 kilometre desert experience in the world of um, ultra endurance running. Um, none other than the Ultra Mirage um, El Jarid um, in Tunisia. So I'm going to bring in um, Amir um, very shortly, who's going to have some fantastic information for anybody, not only people contemplating doing um, this extraordinary 100K, the first one ever in Tunisia. Um, back in 2017, but also anyone who's considering ultras, anyone who's not sure whether it, they can do it or not, whether you're a man or woman, um, it's going to be fairly clear, if not very clear after this week's show, that with the right preparation, mental and physical, um, and with the confidence and the support and the experience of people like Amir, that, um, yeah, you can do it. Okay, you can definitely do it. So, and um, that's said and done. I am going to bring up um, Amir to say hello. There'll be a little three second um, countdown as I get hold of him. Um, and I will do that now. Ding. And there's the ding. And here we should have Amir. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Matt? I'm fine. I've already Very said. I've already said when we were chatting previously before, I think it's the yellow Ultra Mirage sign. You look so much more radiant than me. <laughs> you, look, you look so much healthier. I'm, I'm going to trim my beard. And, yeah. Oh, you, you make me feel old, eh? Anyway, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me in your show. Oh, that's great. Um, you're not actually in Tunisia at the moment, are you? Right now, I'm in uh, Kingswood, Surrey, as England as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> as far from the desert as it gets. <laughs> uh, I was in two minds whether to tell anyone because automatically we assume that you're in some hot country somewhere, you're looking radiant and tanned uh, and healthy. But actually, guys, it's in Surrey. So, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. we have the unusual times of a bit of sun spells, but yeah, today is not uh, is not uh, it's not a very sunny day indeed. Oh, mate, in here it's just I've I've had clinic this morning and five people coming in and just like wet and cold and fed up and don't want to be here and it's just been a bit come on you're okay you can do it anyway <laughs> so um the ultra mirage 100k i can't believe you've actually got the founder and the uh, director so no better person who knows the ins and outs of the race itself um let's get straight down to things shall we um what made you create this race what's your history and how did it make you come up with this great idea well, my history is, uh, I'll start with uh, my very own kind of ultra running. So um, I think like a lot of ultra runners, I had my moment of reckoning back in 2015. It wasn't a great year for me. Um, I had a lot of health issues. I had to go to hospital twice. Um, I was in and out of ER. And this is where I thought, okay, this is the time where I have to do something better with my life. And then came, well, ultra running. <laughs> So uh, I started done a, doing like some uh, smaller but very nice races. Um, you know, I did the Pilgrim Challenge in Surrey. I've, I've, I've kind of done a couple of much less known races. And then I've done the Marathon des Sables in Morocco in 2016. And I kind of loved it. I thought it was a fantastic experience. Um, you know, the mental challenge was there. It kind of ticked all the boxes. And for me, I was like, okay, this is it. I'm going to do this once a year. I'm going to pick one major race, and, and that's going to be my focus. 
And I remember very well, I was in my bed, you know, basically trying to register to the ice marathon uh, for 2017, putting my credit card details. When I thought, hold on a second, um, Tunisia does not have any ultra and it doesn't make any sense. It's a beautiful country. People are friendly. Like what they're lacking in Tunisia to organize such an event. And so I thought, okay, let me have a go. And so early 2017, I've managed to gather like a fantastic team around me. And I started, you know, talk, telling them about my idea. Uh, people were very, very excited. So I really thought at the start that I will get maybe 10, 20 runners. I thought I'll do a nice, you know, 100K desert race. And the way I wanted to create it is really in my head is like, what would be my ideal distance for me? Like, what would be my ideal ultra? My ideal ultra would be like, okay, so first of all, this, I mean, sleeping in tents and all of that is nice, but I'd rather be in a hotel. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, what's the ideal distance? Yeah, I mean, you can do a, a, a 1,000 kilometer run if you want to, that's fine. But like the ideal realistic distance, I think 100 kilometers is, is like a nice milestone for anyone. So I thought 100 kilometers in a fantastic surrounding. And, and again, I cannot stress enough how beautiful South of Tunisia is. I mean, the surrounding of where the, start, the race starts and ends is, well, one of the original movie sets of Star Wars. And you really you have to go there to understand why George Lucas, out of anywhere on the planet, chose that spot because it's outstanding. And so, I th so I thought, listen, I'm gonna do this. I might have 10, 20 runners. Fair enough, let's, let's do that. So the first year, 2017, we had an outstanding 120 people registering for the race. And this is where I, said, I thought, okay, hold on a second. I don't think we have the logistics going, so let's make sure that, you know, reduce the number by half and see kind of how it goes. We had issues with the weather and with some logistics, but like everything went out smoothly. We ended up having a fantastic race. On so the first year, we had 60 runners, um, you know, 11 nationalities, which is amazing. Um, last year, we had 130 runners with 23 nationalities. And this year, hopefully, we're, we're targeting 300 runners with north of, I mean, we're already, in terms of registered, we're already on like 19 nationalities, which is outstanding. Uh, it's quite incredible. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, unfortunately, it's not a part of the world that I've been to yet. But I do, I mean, if anything is going to get me to go to Tunisia, it's been the pictures I've seen of Ian Corliss on Talk Ultra and, and just yeah. researching. I'm thinking, I mean, I'm thinking the Ultra Mirage itself is going to increase tourism in Tunisia tenfold anyway, because the pictures that come out of it and the descriptions as well, because I read a lot of different race descriptions and there seems to be, maybe you can help me out here. I know you're kind of biased but what is it about tunisia i'm hearing like the locals the relationship between the locals and the runners um what is it about tunisia that makes it so friendly and such a I'll, kind of I'll, place for the race I'll tell you, Matt, the reality is is that the ultra mirage it's it's one of these races which is i mean yeah it takes place in tunisia but it is a hundred percent tunisian the right race or well, the race director i'm tunisian the the medical staff we have are tunisian they're outstanding super competent um you know all the supporting staff are tunisians all the logistics are tunisian all the food you're going to either are Tunis is tunisian and um, you know we try to basically incorporate all the region with us so you know we use the local uh, agriculture and um, you know all the you know, we go through a, um, you know, a, a palm, um, you know, exploitation uh, place where basically we use their dates uh, as a fuel for the runners. So everything you see is 100% Tunisian. So the experience of the race is not only the surrounding and any experience you can have by running 100 kilometers in the desert, right? But it's really the interaction you have with the volunteers who are 100% Tunisian, the friendliness of the people. And everybody who came, a lot of people came for the first time to Tunisia back in 2017. A lot of them came back in 2018 with their family because they said, listen, I, I never thought it was this nice and people are super friendly. And so, and this is exactly kind of one of our main objective is to not only put Tunisia on the ultra marathon map, on the ultra trail running map, 
but also just kind of, you know, advertise how beautiful the south of Tunisia is. And most importantly, also for me, is to really create this new generation of Tunisian runners. And now we have some outstanding names. I mean, like some real heroes. Um, you know, Rashid Zghayer, Ali Ben Amor, uh, Iman Ben Salem, Shefia um, Hendawi. These are all names that, like, internationally no one heard about. But I'm sure, like, give them a couple of years and you're going to see them compete internationally. And this is really one of the achievements that we're very proud of. I think, yeah, I think that's probably you've summed it up. That's what's shining through because obviously it's a fantastic race. It's got amazing scenery for the actual runners going there for the technical kind of challenge and everything are brilliant, beautiful. But then, yeah, you're also, it's evident that it's being used as a vehicle to spread the beauty of Tunisia, to make it, like you say, um, very um, um, authentic. Um, and yeah, and it's it's just opening up, up people's eyes. I mean, for example, I thought it was worthwhile just to bring up because people, I don't know about anywhere else, but people in the UK can be pretty damn ignorant when it comes to where things are in the rest of the world, which is why most people voted for Brexit, but that's another <laughs> question we won't get into. Well, <laughs> it's the country which is the most up north in the African continent. So we're right across the Mediterranean Sea from Italy. Uh, actually, it's funny, when you're driving in Tunis or Hammamet in the north in the summer, you can, you can capture Italian radio while you're driving around. This is how close we are to, to Italy. It's, an, it's a three hour flight from London to Tunis. Okay, there's regular flights. Um, and yeah, and then from Tunis down south, it's either 45 minutes plane or six hours car, wherever you want. Both are nice. Yeah. <laughs> there's an awful lot of ignorance. I mean, my ignorance was shown to me recently. I had the honor of um, going over to Kenya to work with some runners there and, a, and a, a new company setting up there. And I had my own preconceptions of what I was going to find, mainly because I've been fed the same pictures of drought and famine and disaster and, and poverty and and, desp and despondency through the media and everything. And then I arrived there and Jesus, show me a you know happier person with a bigger smile and a bigger heart and like people working together and better values in life. And it was just a total eye opener for me. Yeah. And I get the yeah. impression that when people think of the North of Africa, you know, again, because of the news we get of the conflicts and the problems and Egypt and Morocco and Algeria, and it's just for all different reasons. We get such a bastardized impression of what it's like. Well, we've had, so, I mean, like, it's, it's, like, it's kind of I mean, Tunisia had its fair share of problems in the last couple of years, and this is something we can't ignore. But we came back from a lot. I mean, if you look at 2015, it was really a low time for for Tunisia with terror attacks, some very, very horrible stories. And a lot of things have changed since. I mean, security has been reestablished. Tourism is coming back massively. People are talking about double digit returns, uh, double digit um, um, you know, growth for British tourists coming back to Tunisia. Uh, there's like, I mean, yeah, so everyone is pouring back in. It, it is very good value and it is close and well, it's not a European, so I talk about Brexit. <laughs> so, so it it kind of ticks a lot of uh, a lot of boxes. But most importantly, the one thing I want to stress is, you know, apart from the beauty, is is really how open-minded and friendly the the people are. And and it's exactly what you say. You know, you get fed a lot of well, fake news to use that word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The media. And then once you go there and you start talking to people and then you're like, listen, these are really normal people. You know, they could be living in London or like these are citizens of the world. And and I think when you one good thing about the Ultra Mirage, which a lot of people, um, you know, foreign runners coming from all over the world were telling me is it's one of these desert traces. It's probably one of the ultimate desert traces where you have an equal amount of locals running than foreigners um i mean last year a hundred and we had 140 runners and it was yeah it was roughly uh, you know 70 tunisian runners 70 foreign runners and yeah and then you get that spirit of camaraderie you go to a country you run in the country the medical stuff is tunisian you know the you know ev you know the organizers are tunisian the runner next to you is tunisian you can speak to them and it's it's great i don't think you have that in a lot of other races yeah. you have in North Africa or the Middle East, uh, whereas it's it's much more biased towards, well, let's call it Western rather than locals. Yeah, yeah, 
No, that's great. It's a really important factor. And we need more of that. I mean, even just running along the seafront here and most of the locals hate us because you're like knocking them out of their way. So it'd be lovely to run somewhere where the locals actually wave as opposed to just grab their children and kind of like look at you with a bad face. But anyway, that's so. Yeah. So let's um, I mean, you mentioned obviously it's a 100K race, which you yeah. kind of use the words like nice and very pleasant. But for some people, like 100K is like what all in one go. And how does it work? Tell us a little bit about for people who aren't aware of how it works. What is it? How's it go? Checkpoints. Well, well, listen, it's, uh, it's an early start. So we start at uh, seven o'clock. So basically, logistically speaking, uh, usually all the runners are in the same hotel. It's a very, very good hotel we've been working with for like more than two years now. Um, so the departure around five o'clock, 30 people are already on site. Uh, the starting line is the, it's, it's outstanding. It's, it's really surreal because it's in the middle of the desert. You, you still have the old Luke Skywalker village from Star Wars, and I'm very careful yeah. in the world Star and Wars next to each other because I don't want Mickey Mouse to bite my bum. <laughs> <laughs> We're using it as a publicity. But it's really a really very nice spot. Um, and then, you know, starts at seven, sun up, um, and then you need to break it into different stages. I mean, if you look at any race, any ultra, or any distance if you're gonna start the first kilometer thinking great i'm one kilometer down i just have 99 to go i think you're gonna just stop it right there you have to look at it in checkpoints and basically what we do is you know we have checkpoints so the first one is within 20 kilometers which is probably the right distance once everybody's hydrated from the morning and then it goes 15 15 15 and then 20 at the end so you have five different checkpoints um along the race and in checkpoints, what I recommend people is, listen, checkpoints is just not just, you know, you stop there, you drink some water and off you go. You should like take your time, hydrate, eat something. You know, some people sleep, you know, just take a nap, take a nap for 10 minutes. People will wake you up, don't worry. It's not like you're gonna <laughs> sleep all around throughout. So, so it's really a place where you can, you know, break the, break the race in different stages. And this will allow you to kind of digest the distance and you know, you just make friends and like the usual, like you do an ultra, you enjoy the surroundings, you make friends, you talk to people. And that's just, this is what it's all about. You know, you make the best friends during these moments, right? And uh, the, the tougher, the, the, the stronger the friendship, as, as you know, you know, for all, uh, all ultra runners. So it's great. Yeah. And again, you know, you go there and you, you mingle with the stars, you know. Elizabeth Barnes was there last year, and Morabiti brothers were fantastic supporters. Well, they won it every year <laughs> so far, <laughs> so they were doing well. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's very international, very friendly. Like, what can I say? It's a, it's a, it's a very good race, very well priced. Um, but I think, you know, when you look at it, it's. Um, it is a difficult race, you know, it's a hundred kilometers. Um, you know, you have to break it into different stages. There are some part of the race, like there's maybe 10 or 15 kilometers, which is soft sand. So, and, and, and that part of the race is, comes at the moment, which is the worst because it's around midday. Um, it's around the 50th kilometer. So yeah, so it's very, very hard. It's a very hard race psychologically, but then, the sense of achievement you get by finishing this, you really feel you can do really anything. I've had people who've done the race and done all the major races, desert races, who tell me, well, your race is probably as tough, if not tougher, than the long stage of some of the major races in the desert. So mm. yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get into that later on about what you like, but yeah. Um... <laughs> I think some people forget that, I mean, yeah, you've got obviously the elites, but even like it was interesting hearing that even the elites actually walk as well. It's, you haven't got to run the whole way. Some bits of the ground actually demand that you do walk. I've got a nice picture here, I think, of um, somebody walking and mixing with the locals. Yeah, <laughs> very, very friendly locals. <laughs> very friendly locals. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you don't have to run all the way. And like, I mean, you've got the winners in like nine hours plus nine ten eleven twelve hours but what what does some of the back of the pack actually do this 100k in well i think back of, i mean obviously there's a there's a time limit for the race which is uh, 20 hours i mean it's interesting this 20 hours because i've had very mixed feedback some people tell me oh why is it 20 hours you're attracting a lot of 
tourists, you know, people who are going to take their time. Other people tell me, listen, you 20 hours, why don't you push it to 24 hours and it becomes like a one day race? I think 20 hours is the right kind of amount of time when you think about it. It's 100 kilometers, 20 mm -hmm. hours. So technically speaking, you can walk it. I know someone who kind of walked it. Um, it's kind of doable, okay? I think 20 hours is the right level of, of challenge. But yes, I mean, listen, the Elizabeth Barnes had the female record at 10 hours and 25 minutes. Muhammad al Murabiti, Rashid's brother, is, uh, he's done it in uh, 8 hours and 48 minutes. Uh, Rashid last year, which was a tougher race, did it in just uh, over 9 hours. So yeah, I think the elite elite will do it sub 10. But yeah, I mean, sub 10, you do the math, right? I mean, that's a proper endurance. That's kind of, you're not walking, you're proper running kind of throughout. Um, but I think for the, for most of the people, they would, I've had a lot, you know, the, if you look at the bell-shaped distribution, if you want to talk a little bit statistic, then a lot of people would finish it within between 15 and 17, 15 and 17 hours. I think that comes to a very fair amount of time. Um, so just before midnight. So what would you say are some of the prerequisites? What do you recommend people have done already before contemplating doing this event? I mean, listen, you need to, um, I mean, you need to, there's a lot of running involved. I think, you know, in the run up to the race, uh, you need to be able to, you need to, I think ideally you should have done like at least a 50K run. Um, mm -hmm. doesn't need to be in a race. I mean, I do, I don't train, train, but like my weekend jog, I do a 20K Saturday, 20K Sunday. I'm not, okay, it's almost a half marathon. I don't need to sign up for a half marathon. You can just, mm -hmm. you know, put your running shoes on and go and run for 50K. But I think you need to you need to run at least like a hundred kilometers per week for a couple of weeks. Um, mm. You know, make sure that um, you know your knees are there. Try to run. I know in Europe it's not ideal, but try to run on sand. That would kind of help a lot. It's not all sandy because there's a lot of like salt flats across the race, um, which will you know a big part of it is salt flat, which is fantastic. But I think you get that diversity in the terrain. Um, it's not kind of all constant. So you need to be able to do a bit of hills, a bit of running on sand. So you need to diversify your training a little bit. Um, it is flat. So, you know, in the desert, uh, that region, you know, there's no very little mountains. Um, so there's no elevations at all. So you don't need to worry about elevations. But you know what? If you don't worry about elevations, you know, sometimes you have like sand dune, which are like 10, 20 meters high. But mate, 20, 10, 20 meters high on sand is is a tough one. It's not, mm, it's not kind of an easy one. So training is very, very important. But listen, we're like we're like late late in September, early October in terms of timing with the race. Heat is a factor. So I think for people who want to participate, really use the summertime, like July, August, if you're in Europe, to run as much as you can to to get your body used to the heat. And you know any mix, any shakes you're drinking while you're running, make sure to drink them while it's hot. We had peaks of like low 40 degrees Celsius in both races in 2017, 2018. And yeah, water has a different taste when it's hot. So yeah, ecologically, get used to the heat and and like use the summertime to to do most of the training. And then you know August and then September you start tapering, and then fifth of fifth of October you're good to go. The funny thing about that, when I look at the feedback of most of the runners, people who've enjoyed the race the most are those who did not Zoom run it. Like people who finished around midnight, one o'clock, so basically taking, you know, 18, 17, 18, 19 hours to finish. They are the ones who loved it because they took their time, they spoke to people, they took their time in the checkpoints. They run during the night, which I love doing. Like running in the desert nighttime is, that's the experience, right? That's what you want to do. And all of them, they're like, listen, this is amazing. Like, when, where do I sign up? And this is kind of the rewards for me as organizers to, to have people who went through, well, let's call it hell, and come at the end, take their medals and say, listen, this was fantastic. It changed me. This is a major challenge. I want to come back next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's beautiful. I mean, you're selling it to me. I could just listen to you forever, and as I'm booking my tickets as we speak. But it's like, no, it sounds absolutely beautiful. And it was inter- you mentioned Elizabeth Barnes, who we had on the show a few weeks ago, and, and I'm still trying to get over mentioning or comparing her to Kim Kardashian. But that's you'll have to watch the episode to see why I did that <laughs> on many levels. But um, yeah, what sort of percentage of the runners are men and women? Well, um, so first of all, compared to talking to many women, uh, we were quite a pioneer, at least in Tunisia, in offering the same money prizes for men and mm. women. Uh, and you know what? It's something I'm very, very proud of, Matt. The reason why I'm proud of is the day we made the announcement that the prize money is equal for men and women, I've had a spike in the number of Tunisian women runners signing up. I don't think these women were eager to win the 3,000 euros prize. But as a matter of principle, you know, they're basically, we're going in saying, we think you're equal to man. It makes absolutely no sense. Um, and I know that like the equality women to man is a little bit of a political subject in Tunisia, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll swim through it. <laughs> but I think it's, it's something I'm very, very proud of. But yeah, I mean, listen, talking about Elizabeth Warren, it's, it's fantastic. The first time, you're gonna love the story. The first time I met Elizabeth Barnes was in uh, the Marathon in 2016. I was myself very new to uh, to ultra running. So here I am, rock into Morocco, basically. It was the day where they check, uh, you know, your bag. They see if you have enough um, food and they count the calories, etc. So I was standing in the queue. This is April 2017. And there was this woman, you know, just in front of me in the queue. Okay. So, well, I started chatting to her. It was super nice, giving me all kinds of advice about hydration. You know, you need to take your salt pills, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, it's fantastic. You look like you, you really know what you're talking about. What's your name? <laughs> fantastic. I'm like, so it looks like you've done this before. She's like, yeah, yeah, I've done it last year. I'm like, oh, how did that go? She's like, yeah, I came first. <laughs> so, Brilliant. So oh, great. So, yeah, uh, yeah. So what was your reaction? Was it like, yeah, I was like, okay, I'm okay. on my business now and pretend I'm looking at something on my phone. But no, she was very, she's fantastic and um, she had a very, very good run. Uh, she still holds the record for women runners in the Ultra Mirage, you know, 10 hours and um, and 15 minutes, um, mm. which I think is, uh, sorry, 10 hours and 35 minutes, uh, which is a fantastic performance in view of how hard the, the race was last year. But again, mm. You know, the funny thing, Matt, is like you, you meet these athletes who are like your ideal runners and then they come to your own race. Like I met Rashid and Murabiti again in 2016 in, in Marathon des Sables and he was super nice, extremely down to earth. And I'm like, listen, it's amazing. And he was telling me, listen, oh, you're Tunisian, but where are all the Tunisian runners? And I'm like, yeah, I was the only Tunisian runner back in 2016 in Marathon des Sables. And this is why I want to promote the sport in Tunisia. It's extremely important. But yeah, mm-hmm. since then, we've had Elizabeth came in, Rafi, <laughs> Mohammed. I mean, yeah. And now even for next year, we have Ian Morgan from New Zealand coming. We have Fran Gonzalez from Chile coming. We have Bushra from Sweden coming. Andre Vasilenko from Russia. And Murabiti brothers. Christophe Rousseau from France. It's, it's overwhelming, it's fantastic. Um, and I really, like, you know, the feedback I get from these runners is, is amazing about the race. It's like how authentic it is, how most of them never came to Tunisia and they're coming to Tunisia to discover it under a really different, like, scene. Um, mm. and something that makes me very, very proud. Yeah, that's no, beautiful here. I think, I mean, that's what we strive for. It doesn't always happen, but the idea in successful running clubs anywhere, whether it's a club or a group, the idea is it is a level surface for the faster runners to mix with the slower runners. Because everyone's been there. Sorry. Um, that's okay. There's an international call. <laughs> no, it's dead. But yeah, so I mean, it's it's a beautiful opportunity, and and hopefully the running world kind of shows it where you can get someone who's really good at their craft just mixing with somebody who's just arrived, and yet you're on a level field, like Absolutely. you said, with a little bit in the queue. You know, you're humans. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, which doesn't happen in so many other sports. You know what? I'm happy to you say that when people ask me about ultra running or running in general, I say you give me one sport 
like if you love tennis, when are you ever gonna compete in a tournament with Federer next to you? Exactly. It doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. It's only okay, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Or racing, or you name it, or football, or anything like that. This is really. It's so democratic. It's so kind of you know equal yeah. level for everyone. And this is really what I really really like. It's uh, this is what's amazing in ultra running. Yeah, it is a beautiful thing. Um, I mean, we've mentioned the elites a few times. I've just got to bring this up because this is just my photo of the month. <laughs> Explain what was going on in this one here then for us. Well, that's uh, Rafida Murabiti, obviously, when he crossed the finish line after nine hours and 11 minutes. He, I mean, it's still, I have to emphasize, he didn't break his brother's record from last year, which was like eight hours and 48 minutes. But last year, the race was very tough. And I think this is something that, that Elizabeth Bond touched on um, in your show a couple of weeks ago. There was a major, major uh, sandstorm, uh, literally two days before the race. And what sand, sandstorm does, I think like you really have to be in it to, to understand how huge it is. It's literally cloud. You can't see anything. And it's not really sand. It's like sand dust and like tons of it going up in the air and then coming down. So what happened is we've had like literally the whole surface covered in this um, like sand dust, which made a lot of a big part of the terrain, you know, very soft, sandy, very difficult to uh, to run on. And and I think Rashid had a fantastic performance, uh, just uh, finishing the race a little bit over nine hours. And yeah, he came in. I was waiting in the finish line, um, like I do with all my runners. So making sure that everybody kind of comes in in one piece. Uh, otherwise, I can't sleep or do anything. <laughs> and then he collapsed in my arms and uh, he was really really tired i mean let's make sure like make sure that everybody knows like it took him 10 minutes and then he was dancing so <laughs> he, was, he was like he had all the media all over him he was like into being interviewed with like all the national television and international television so he's done a fantastic performance but yes this is really like i so look up to him as as an athlete and Mm. For people who have not met uh, Rashid, Rashid and Murabti or even Mohammed, he is the most down-to-earth athlete you'll ever meet. Zero attitude. You know, you can go speak to him, whoever you are. He'll always have time to speak to you, explain. He's really very, very passionate about the desert. He's really very passionate about running. And like for me, this is like a textbook of what an ultra athlete should be, you know, down-to-earth, simple man zero attitude like just love him love him to bits. yeah and for people listeners who aren't aware this is we're talking six times now is it winner of Ralph and Sabla? yeah i just yeah. a phenomenal uh, he's, uh, he's, he's done extremely extremely well and now muhammad his brother um with a bit younger than him i'm not gonna start disclosing age but he's he's also doing a very very good job an outstanding job so uh they're both I wonder, good. yeah, I wonder how dinner was that evening between the two brothers when Mohammed wins it last year and then along comes his brother and kind of beats him and I wonder how competitive they are between each other. Well, to be honest, in, in all fairness, in all fairness, Rashid was due to come in 2017 with Mohammed. The thing is, uh, Rashid has signed up for, I think, for UTMB, uh, which is like a couple of weeks before. So. There was an issue between his different like race calendars. This is why he couldn't make it. But I mean, it's lovely to see both brothers there. I think, uh, you know, I like, I love the fact that, you know, you have, you know, brothers running with, with each other. We have a couple of them. I love the fact that we have couples running with each other. Uh, but one of the famous couples, obviously, Sondre and Elizabeth were running last year. Um, I love this kind of couple, brothers, uh, father, father and son uh, races. I think it's it's great. I mean, it just kind of puts it. It's a very different family or couples holiday. It's um, it just kind of puts in in in, in different perspective, and um, I think yeah. it's it's great. And Which I actually, you mentioned Sondre. Sondre was like the guy who split the brothers up incredibly. Amazing. Um, yeah, wasn't that something else? Um, and obviously coming from quite a big background and he's he's um placed very well in other but that must have been a i think i read a uh, on his blog he was very surprised and honored 
you know, to uh, to beat Mohammed. But yeah, that must have been an incredible atmosphere. He had an outstanding race. I mean, well done to him because I think he came in. I don't think he was expecting much. I mean, he he's run obviously a few desert races. He was in. I think he did the uh, Oman by UTMB a couple of weeks before, mm. but. Um, but it wasn't expected, and uh, he wasn't in the lead. Um, it, it's really in the last 20 to 30K that he was really going for it. And I remember, like, my team in the final checkpoint, in the 80K, Sondre arrived in the checkpoint, rests a little bit, and he first question, where is Rashid? And they said, oh, well, he left six minutes ago. It's like, okay, hold on to this. I'm going to try to catch him up. And he, yeah. went, he tried for 20 kilometers. He tried really hard to catch up with Rashid. So, I mean, the time difference is not, it's not huge. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's like a couple of, you know, 10, 20 minutes, which is outstanding performance for Sandra. I was very, very pleased for him. Very, very good performance. But of course, I know that's what he said, but I do wonder as well how much he was trying to get in front of the fourth place. On the race as well because i mean normally in these races you know we split it into male finishers and female finishers and there's normally time in between but obviously in the ultra mirage incredibly fourth place out of everybody was elizabeth absolutely, you know? absolutely. so uh, yeah i think he was just trying to uh yeah nothing's going to make you run faster than you know your partner behind trying to catch you up i think that's probably what or maybe i'm wrong speculation i don't know i'm not sure about the i'm not sure about the the, the sondre versus a little bit kind of uh, <laughs> In the relationship on how they run together. <laughs> they haven't, I haven't seen them run together during the race. I think they were like each one of them kind of concentrated in their own field, which is kind of mm. well done to them. But um, but again, yeah, I think Elizabeth coming um, coming forth is is really an outstanding performance. But it really begs the questions about you know female participation in this kind of mm, ultra exactly. races. I mean, we've seen Miss Paris, right? I mean, all over the media. Um, mm. And, and and now like everybody's talking about how women and men are like on an equal playing field when it comes to ultra running. Of course, short distances is different. We have different, our bodies are built differently, but the more the race is psychologically, mentally challenging, the more women has an equal opportunity to, to beat men. And I think this is something that, you know, has to be recognized, which is probably, you know the, the the most gender equal sports out there yeah yeah, yeah definitely and elizabeth kind of yeah commented on that because it's like i think it's said on every single ultra podcast there is but ultras are kind of 90 percent mental and the other 10 percent's in your brain or in your mind it's a big factor yeah. and we all know how i'm not gonna say stubborn how determined women can be in yeah. achieving what they want so i think it shines oh, through yeah. particularly at that age particularly at you know 30 plus where yeah. a lot of them do yeah. shine through and they're giving their male counterparts, well, beating lots of them, let's face it, beats leading well, loads yeah. of them. But that's the thing, Matt. I mean, you've had a lot of big surprises. So, like last year, when, I, when you look at Oriane Dujardin, a French woman who came second after Elizabeth Barnes, she's never run an ultra in her life. Correct. And finished the race, outstanding time, smile on her face. She did an outstanding job. And this is, again, these are one of the races where people discover their own self you know you spend time with yourself and it's really about kind of mental determination like do you want to finish this it's hard yes guess what it's very hard you knew it was hard but like where do you want to finish and this is what kind of i love about it is seeing this kind of new type of champion coming in and defying gravity this is what makes this competition amazing and um, the third place Tunisian uh, female runner, Shefia. Yeah, Hendawi. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I mean, again, Matt, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I was so eager to create the Ultra Mirage is, you know, 2016, Marathon de Sable, not a single Tunisian runner. So I was, I was the champion of Tunisia. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, God, that's really big. Got to the title. Yeah. And, and the, re the reality is, you know, when when I opened up the race in 2017, 100 kilometers in the desert, not far off the summertime, I really thought no Tunisian would sign up. And I was surprised. Everyone wanted to come. Everyone. It was fantastic. And this is where basically, as I said, we will help and create this new generation of Tunisian ultra runners. 
who are now getting, you know, ITRA points to go and run in, uh, you know, ETMB or in other races. And that we did not have before in Tunisia, you know, ultra running. You know, I hate the fact that in some aspects, ultra running is a little bit, I don't want to say in any trace, but like money wise, well, yeah, it's an expensive hobby. Okay. And, and I think that, you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to kind of push for this race is really make it accessible to everyone. And I think now we're discovering new superstars in Tunisia. As I said, Shefia Hindawi has had an amazing time. She's now like one of the top uh, ultra athletes in, in Tunisia. Uh, Iman bin Salim is one, Mohammed uh, Baratli, Ali bin Amor, Rashid Zghayr, all these names no one's ever heard of. They're very well known in Tunisia. Internationally, no one's heard of them. But you wait. You give them to the honestly, You wait. You wait. Yeah, yeah. You have a new generation of Tunisian runners and it's coming to them. And, and once they're in, you know, they see the Moroccan elite runners and they're like, listen, Moroccans, Tunisian, we're kind of very similar, you know, atmosphere, country, what have you. So there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't see like Tunisians and, you know, competing in major, major yeah. competitions uh, across the world, really. Well, that's interesting as well. It's something I wanted to get your uh, uh, your your opinion on. The, obviously, the, on paper, there seems to be an advantage from coming from the part of the world you're running in. You're kind of used to the terrain, the heat, which maybe is why the, the Moroccans shine so much in it. Um, and also the Tunisian athletes coming through. But then again, without making this the kind of Sandra and Elizabeth show, you've got someone from Norway and Sweden <laughs> mucking up that idea completely. Yes. You know, yes. so it can't. I guess these guys are living and training in similar places as well. That's probably the answer, actually, probably answer my own question. So, it's really because, you know, one thing I always say, Matt, is that when you look at, well, let's take Moroccans and, and Marathon de Sable, right? Marathon de Sable, fantastic race. It's been around for 36 years. Well, when uh, Patrick Boer created Marathon de Sable in 1986, from 1986 to 1996, there was no Moroccan on the podium. Wow. They were Russian, they were French, they were internationals. And there you can beg the question, but hold on a second. These guys are running in your neighborhood. They're running in the desert. How come you don't have any you know, Moroccan runners? Well, guess what? It does take time. It does take time for people to get used to this kind of discipline. It does take time to just promote the sport in any given country. And guess what? You go to Marathon de Sable now, you always have a Moroccan in the top three. Yeah, know, yeah. All the time. Yeah, yeah. But guess what? You know, this is what you want to have in Tunisia. I mean, I hope it's not going to take us 10 years, but I would love to live the moment where I'm going to have, you know, a Tunisian woman. Well, we had the Tunisian woman, number one, uh, Iman bin Salem, back in 2017. Uh, but, like, my point is, you're absolutely right. You know, how come, you know, and someone from, you know, Sweden can do that well? Well, it's a discipline, it's, it's the training, it's the mental, you know, it's just kind of the boundaries, the, the mental boundaries you're always breaking on each single race. Every race will make you better. Even if you don't finish the race, you become better because you know yourself better. And I think this is exactly what it takes, um, you know, for the Tunisian runners to become, you know, the new elite runners. And now, like, I look at the ITRA websites, um, you know, if you select Tunisian runners, you know, two years ago, there were like maybe five of them. Well, guess what? Now you click and you put Tunisian runners and you have like a hundred. It's fantastic. And this is a major, yeah. major achievement for the Ultra Mirage, which is like getting the locals in. And and this is this is very important for me. Yeah, no, it's huge things. Yeah, it's true. And once someone in a country or even just a, a woman shines, then hopefully other women and other people from that country will step forward and think, I can do this. It happens all the time, doesn't it, in sport? Once Tyson got put down, everybody could beat Tyson. It's like, yeah. it's that mental preparation as well. So let's spend the last, um, uh, well, at least the next five, ten minutes on, you've obviously got an insider's guide now on how to best prepare for this particular event, if not all events, but particularly this. If you were, like I know there's people watching who are actually going to come along to this and it's going to be their first 100K, um, what do you think are the main key elements in preparation for this? You've mentioned the sand, which obviously is a different way of running. Well, what I else? It's, it's really the heat is one aspect. Um, I mean, it is it is going to, going to be, I mean, temperature, if you look at the like average during the season average, if, you know, you scroll down back in Tozer or in the Jirid 
um, zone um, that time of year is like in the mid 30s so you really need to use the summertime so july august in europe just do as much running in the heat like wait till the sun is way high up don't do it in the morning or the evening and just kind of get your body used to the heat um you know get used to like have your equipment ready run with the same equipment with the same running shoes you're going to be using try to get away with some runs on sand if you're spending holidays well in tunisia for example in the summer <laughs> in preparation for the ultra mirage but really yeah, you, need yeah. of, you need to have a lot of running you need to have a lot of running under your belt um, yeah 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 going going into the race but again you know you have to think about it if you break it into you know 20k 15k race it is very doable it's very mental but you need to have you need to have run like a couple of hundred kilometers per week um you know going into the race but it's very doable like we have have all type of finishers we have unique finishers we have the people who took them exactly 19 hours and 58 minutes to finish uh, we have an example yeah. like a British runner who i love who's been kind of participating every year so we we have that and um so it is doable but you just need to you need to put in a lot of funding um, into it first yeah and are you aware of any training camps that kind of would help people prepare for um for the events maybe for example people in the uk to get out or people in europe where, where can you go i think there's loads of training caps i mean i can advertise i mean you can go on the internet and they look at like training caps in the desert um yeah like yeah that time of year i think you know it's a lot of the people who do like the major races end of the year and in april and in morocco mm. uh, basically use these uh these for uh, for training and uh, yeah i mean i like training camps i've 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 never done a training camp myself. Well, actually, I did, uh, but it's more like um, running on the beach in Wales. <laughs> it's, it's very, Wales? Yeah, in Wales. Wales has <laughs> massive, okay. massive sandy beaches. Very few people know it. It's very beautiful, actually. So wow. I've been in the summer. Um, but yeah, I mean, listen, you need to find ways to run on sand. Some people in London tell yeah. me that there's, there's bits of Hyde Park where, where it's kind of sand, where the horses run. And then they yeah, yeah. You know that part of sand. Yeah, I mean, you can always find sand or something similar to to run on. I feel as a sports therapist, particularly on the podcast, I should put in a warning here, a caveat: if you are going to start running on sand, do it sporadically and only for short periods of time, and don't jump straight into a pair of innovates. Because I remember in Mexico back in when Born to Run had just come out, I was on holiday and I just read the book and I was like yes this is my moment and now i am barefoot running along the mexican sands hearing the voices of indians in the wind and yeah double achilles tendinopathy back at work at hardy walk so yeah sand training starts off as with everything very gently and then just build it in gradually i don't want my podcast to be responsible for all these achilles exactly yeah, but if you do injure yourself in Studio 57 in Hove, we're a stone's throw away from Hove Station. So there you go. There's a plug for the studio. Anyway, right. Let's see. I've got some questions. Oh, here we go. Um, bum, bum, bum. Oh, here's one actually for you. I'm here. From Gerald Vernier. I feel this may be a loaded question, but let's have a little look. Amir, do you have any running challenges in the near future? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> do you know Gerald Vernier? I know of Gerald right here, yeah. Oh, well, he wants to know about your challenges. Well, my challenge is um, I've, I've tried to do the Algerit uh, solo crossing last year, uh, which is the largest salt flats in, in, in the Sahara. Um, it's 70 kilometers of complete salt flats. So it's like completely, well, flat salt white. Um, and I wanted to do it solo. There's this uh, very well-known uh, French expression, which is marche uh, ou which in English means run or die. <laughs> so I put it literally, which is uh, which is uh, which is running solo. So the way it works is I get my team to drop me uh, water reserves along the way, and I, with my GPS, I go from one point to the other, uh, drinking water obviously, because I can't carry more than like three liters of water. Uh, last year, um, it was extremely hot. So uh, I had to stop my race 
around the 52nd kilometer because I was just kind of running out of water and I was, um, it was way, way too hot. And I think it's a little bit, it was a little bit of my mistake. It was a little bit of a miscalculation. I needed to have water station much closer to each other, maybe every five kilometers rather than every 15. So I'm going to do this again in July, in the middle of the summer, crossing the desert by myself. And I'm really looking forward to it. And how would it, is this going to be documented? Will there be like a live blog, someone kind of filling us in on your journey? or You're going to be able to track me uh, on my satellite tracker. So, yeah. Oh, wow. You'll be okay. able to so that's hopefully July. You're going to ask me, but like, why would you want to run in the desert in July? <laughs> <laughs> well, one, because I'm yeah, a bit crazy, but also because that's the only time in the year where basically the soil flats are completely dry. Okay. But I mean, I can't stress how amazing the site is. You're running and pretty much across 5,000 square kilometers of complete emptiness. So wherever you look, the horizon is the same. There's no trees, there's no stones, there's no nothing, there's no mountain, there's absolutely nothing. Just the sun, the blue sky, and well, white, white salt under, you, under your running shoes. So that I'm going to be doing in, in July. Um, very excited about. And, Amazing. Uh, and yeah. Oh, be for, and people, if people want to follow that, will there be details or are the details going up on to details as we get closer to the uh, as we get closer to the event. So um, and that'll be at ultramirage.com. That will be probably ultra mirage or it will be on the internet somewhere. Don't worry. Okay, I'll, brilliant. I'll, okay, then. Um actually you mentioned Wales. I've got somebody from my neck of the woods, um, Lisa, who's already down to do the uh, um ultra mirage. And this year, Excellent. she's got a 90 miler in Wales next week. Let's just put a comment up on here. Um, she's asking, how did you find the cold weather running? She hasn't got sand to deal with. She's got loads of snow, apparently. Um, yeah, it, but you know what? I mean, cold weather, I, I don't mind running in cold. I think you just cover up. It's good fun. I mean, if... I mean, yeah, if I have my running gloves on and I have my full gear on my head, just protecting my ears, I'm good to run pretty much anywhere. I think you just need to, I think running, if you're training for the Ultra Mirage, you need to enjoy, you don't, you don't have to see it as you're training for it. It's just a therapy, it's just, you're doing it for fun, you're preparing a major challenge in your life by having fun running with distances and initially for people who were not big runners 10k would sound massive and then 10k would sound ridiculously small and then 20k would sound massive and then 20k will be easy and so on and so forth and and this is this is how it's not about the end result of finishing the ultra mirage it's really the journey that takes you from basically being a, a normal human being on the couch to being an ultra runner, which is these stages, you're going to see your body change, you're going to be your mental, you know, mental state change. And then every run, even if it's snowing, running outside, you're going to say, well, yeah, it's a bit of snow, it's a bit of water, whatever, it's fine, I'll just go for it. And I think yeah. once you're there, and then you finish, this is where you get like that sense of reward, which is outstanding. So it's really, really the journey. So Lisa, I'm really looking forward to seeing you down south in Tunisia. And uh, and actually, I'm, I'm about to organize drinks for the, uh, well, like English, British runners of the Ultra Mirage. Uh, we've done one before the Christmas and it was really, really nice. Yet. So I'm looking forward to organizing one where we'll, we'll have everybody here. Oh, what would that? Where would that be? Do you think? Uh, probably, I don't know, somewhere in London, wherever it's convenient. Oh, somewhere in London. Oh, brilliant. Oh, wow, yeah. that's something then. Well, there we go. Newsflash on this show. It's a new one. Lisa, you're having a personal dinner with Amir, apparently. And no, fantastic. I <laughs> look forward to it. Now, Lisa will be fine, I'm sure. She's a fantastic girl and um, very, yeah, very focused. I think on her Instagram, she put a picture of her in the snow, just having a cup of tea with no shoes on, just to get her body used to the cold she's yeah she's she's fine she'll be fine I think she'll be fine <laughs> anyway so um let's finish off just with some news i mean obviously if people want information about this year's event then they can go to www.ultimirage.com what date is it this year 
Well, they, they, can, uh, they have any questions to ask. Uh, any logistical concern, they should speak to me or anyone in the team. We're very help, uh, you know, able to help across the world. We're very, also, we're eager to put people, um, you know, to connect people together. You know, I've had people from all around the world telling me, listen, I'm coming from this place. You know, can you connect me to other runners who are doing Ultra Mirage? So, so yeah, so I think the spirit of camaraderie will build up uh, going in. Uh, I'll just use the last couple of moments to just make a tiny announcement. Um, you know, what we try to do ahead of uh, Valentine's Day on the 14th of February. There you go. Thanks for showing that. <laughs> so what we'll be offering to any couple who register together uh, is basically having a honeymooners package once they arrive to the hotel. So they'll have, you know, the whole shebang, the whole spa, massage, therapy, um, you know, wine on us, uh, fruit baskets, um, you know, special treatment. Uh, that's kind of uh, all inclusive uh, for all the couples who are eager to come and run the Ultra Mirage. I think it's a fantastic, uh, fantastic, uh, you know, Valentine's Day, <laughs> um, you know, gift, uh, you know, for, for anyone. So, uh, so I would encourage really people to sign up. That's fantastic. You're a big softie, really, aren't you? Somebody's uh -huh. going to go solo crossing El Jarid. Yeah, you obviously, uh, yeah. It sounds like your wife's a lucky lady. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Is that not quite so true? In the <laughs> we won't go down there. Okay, so that's fantastic. And again, they'll be able to get information from that online. There is a, you, you guys have got an amazing social, it's so important these days. Yeah. But I think it's it's not so much, again, quantity, it's quality, but your your presence online is is both. It's there so people can find you on Facebook and Instagram, but it's quality as well. Yeah. You can see the passion shines through with people like Rayo and it's it's great. Well, you yeah, do a really good job. Yeah. I mean, we have a fantastic team all around. I mean, when it comes to logistics or PR or you name it, I mean, yeah, Raya uh, Benghiz has been doing an outstanding job uh, just kind of, um, you know, making sure that the race is, is in the forefront of, of all the publications. And, yeah, we, we have an amazing team kind of all around, and we're very, very proud of it. It's 100% um, it's Tunisian. Uh, we have all the same objective. You know, we're all passionate about running. We're all passionate about Tunisia. And, uh, and I think we've managed to do an amazing job. And I think there's much, much more to come uh, in terms of authenticity, in terms of surprises. We're really trying to do our best, uh, you know, to make the race kind of bigger, to improve the kind of user's journey from the day that they land in Tunis till they arrive, till they take off. And so far it's been, you know, the feedback has been outstanding. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, we're really very, very happy and very grateful for all the guys who've been kind of massive sponsors and, and trying to help us out achieving this well mirage which or dream which became rea reality uh, so it definitely shines through and even and I, I i was aware of it before but even uh, hopefully people listening to you today and seeing the actual founder and race director saying what you're saying the passion obviously shows through it's 100 percent authentic um, and i'm hoping that anyone who's listening to the podcast or watching um, today we'll go along to ultramirage.com uh, and, and find out some details. Um, so, wow, 228, 328. Oh, no, you're in Surrey, aren't you? It's the same time in Surrey, I think, to Brighton. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how long? You, so, how much of your time do you spend in the UK? Then you kind of flying backwards and forwards quite yeah, a lot. Uh, well, my next time I'm gonna go down. Uh, I'm gonna go back to Tunisia this Friday. I'm gonna go down to Sfax, which is the second largest city in Tunisia, uh, mm -hmm. on Sunday to advertise the race. Uh, I'm gonna meet my sponsors on on Tuesday. On uh, sorry, on Saturday we have the after movie coming up uh, end of February, which I'm sure everybody will love. Uh, so there's a lot of kind of events. We try to organize events in the UK, in Italy, and France, where most of our international runners are coming from, just to kind of advertise the race. And we've been having so far outstanding support from all around. You know, when it comes to you know the local authorities in Tunisia, um, you know the you know Ministry of Tourism, um, you know private sector banks, what have you. So it's been really overwhelming. So it's great. That's amazing. Right. Well, well, thank you so much again, Amir, for coming on on your uh, Sunday afternoon this time. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, you're, you're, you and your fantastic team all over social media. There's plenty of ways to contact you. 
Um, so yeah, thank you very much. I'm I'm definitely going to be looking to book um, a chip over there. Maybe yeah. not to run yeah. 100k yet, but um, half marathon being my preferred distance. But you never know. I'm feeling that kind of butterfly yeah. inside, thinking actually it's got a point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm old and I'm mental, so I probably you know I've, I've, I've got two of <laughs> I've got two of the uh, characteristics. Yeah. All right, well look, I'll say goodbye. Thank you so much. I look forward to staying in contact. Okay. And um, yeah, have a great day and good luck with everything you do. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Bye bye. Bye. Right. So that was um, the wonderful Amir Ben Gassim. What an what an inspirational guy. I mean, I mean, talk about being up Tunisia. I'm seeing a political move there afterwards. Um, you know, if once once the uh, ultra has, has is looking after itself, but yeah, inspirational uh, and so nice to get a chance to listen to the actual race director. When you've got a race where the director's coming online to answer questions, you know you've got a great race. You know, I mean, they know where you know where the most important um, bread and butter is of the race. So, I hope you've all enjoyed that. I hope the uh, time helped you. Um, 1:30 p.m. As always, if you've got any feedback, then uh, you can reach me. Um, website has moved over now you can forget about sport injury mat um it's now become run chat live officially runchatlive.com so if you've got any questions or info you can either go there and use the contact form or you can email me uh, matt at runchatlive.com um and uh, that's about it for now so hope you've enjoyed the show thanks again to my guest um, amir volt mirage el jurid and we will be back i think oh, you'll have to look at our social media i never know who's coming on next but we've got some fantastic other guests lined up. So do stay with us. Leave some comments. Spread the good word. Spread the ultra mirage. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next week or the week after. Thank you. Take care.